Um, we're going to continue talking about design. And, and last time we talked a lot about what makes a good design of a web page and by extension a good design of a website. And a lot of it related to first of all simplicity, being able to, to navigate the site quickly and easily, being able to find what you want quickly, and those sorts of things. So related to the simplicity of the use of the site. All right. Um, and that, that obviously is very important. You know, who, who would want to say, I want to go to a site where it's really hard to find what I want? You know, it just doesn't make any sense, right? The reason that there are websites is to provide information or to provide services to people. And therefore, a, a goal of anyone is going to be to find stuff easy. About the only exception to that is there might be some sites for entertainment that you get into and you just sort of meander around and you're not really looking for anything in particular, you just want to have a good time. All right. So that would be, um, I guess, uh, maybe the exception to the rule. You know, I've seen websites designed for movies, for example, that were not really straightforward, and, but that was part of the fun of it. You know? and, and those are by far the rare exception. For the most part, simplicity is the key uh, to this. Now, being able to what you being able to and simplicity relates to being able to find what you want, having things expressed in a very concise way, simple way, providing additional information if needed. For example, click here to read more. All those things are important and can provide the levels of depth necessary for, to, to accommodate what, what different people are looking for and what different people's needs are. So I think, I think we covered that aspect of it very well. Let me ask a question. Is it important for a web page to look nice, to look attractive? Yes, no, or maybe? Okay, we have one vote for yes. Why do you say yes? Okay. Uh, the, the statement was made that, um, that the more attractive your page is, um, the, the longer the people are going to stay on it, um, and therefore you have a, a greater chance to make a good impression, and so on. And there, there's definitely truth to that. So what, what, what is said uh, makes sense. There's a book, um, and I believe it's available in our library, uh, by Don Norman, who's a famous designer, and it is uh, called Emotional Design. And he talks about uh, how people, you know, develop an emotional response to things. And even things, like, you know, people say, I love my iPhone, I love my iPod, I love my PS3, or whatever. You know, people have an emotional attachment to these objects. And he said it's an interesting thing because if you like an object and if you like something that you're using, you're going to be more forgiving of it. You know, if, if, someone, if a friend of yours says a comment that you don't really appreciate, well, you know, you'll, you'll probably let it pass or, or it, you'll definitely let it blow over quicker than if someone you don't like makes a comment that you don't like, right? So web pages that you like, and like on an aesthetic level, you're apt to spend more time on. And you're apt to be a little more forgiving if you can't find what you want immediately. Because, hey, face it, some web pages have a lot of content on it. And try as they may, you're not always necessarily going to uh, be able to um, uh, organize it so that finding everything is obvious. Are there any other questions or comments? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 have, I, have, I have problems with it as well. I can never find anything I'm, I'm looking for. Did you ever for. use the search engine on this website? On this Only a couple times, then I, then I have not, because 
it doesn't work. Right, yeah, right. And, and it's funny because the answer that you'll always get from web developers when you say that, you know, well, they'll say, well, well that, that information is on there. Well, so what? If you can't find it, it's almost the same as it not being there, right? Or if it's too difficult to find. Well, now, it's right, exactly. And, and depending on the circumstances, that can be deadly. Because, hey, I work here at LC, right? So let's say I'm looking online uh, in the employee section for a vacation form, all right? I have to find LC's vacation form. I can't say, well, gee, I'll go and see if I can find a vacation form on tri -C site, right? It just doesn't make sense. So I'm kind of locked into finding it there. But if you think about it in other context where you can't find something, if you're, for example, on the Home Depot website and you can't find anything, what are you going to say? I'll go over to the Lowe's website and you can go and you can, you know, if you can find it like that. And again, I don't know if this is the case for either of those sites, but if you could find it more easily on one, there's nothing keeping you from going there. So that does become an issue. You were going to comment about attractive. I thought I heard you start to say something. Okay. Uh, raised a couple good points. First of all, context is important. All right. Um, give an example of, of how context would be important. You or anyone else. Why would context be important as far as the attractiveness of a site? Okay, uh, if, yeah, if you're, well, or put differently, there may be different standards for what is attractive if, say, you're doing it on heavy metal music versus you're, ha you're running a fashion site, all right? All right, a professional site, you want it to look more professional, so maybe a little more subdued as compared to something for entertainment, something for entertainment you might you might do some things, um, you, you, might, you might paint with a broader palette, to use uh, an expression, whereas with a professional site, you're going to keep things more simple, more down the business. There's, a, uh, there's an article, and I believe it's in the resources section of uh, Angel, that says that the, the most expensive real estate on earth is the, you know, what would that be, one square foot? of space that a company's web page uh, is because they spend you know thousands of dollars working on that one square foot to make sure it looks good that it conveys what the company wants to convey and so on so there's a word that I absolutely despise but I'm going to use it all right uh, and, and that word is branding you, you know you hear a lot about a company's branding efforts and I I guess I don't have a problem with the word. I think it kind of sounds hokey. But what it's about, this is about creating like a corporate identity. All right? Again, when there's certain companies that when you think of, there's images that pop into your mind. All right? If I were to, you know, uh, you know if, if I say the word Apple computers, all right? Or actually their name isn't Apple computers anymore. Their name is simply Apple. If you think of the Apple Corporation, you know, you tend to think of something modern, of something sleek, of something well designed. You know, that's the image that you're trying to portray. If I were to say, um, you know, Lincoln Continental, you have another image in your mind. Very upscale, very rich, very whatever. And you can, you can follow this down the line, um, you know. If, if I say, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think... Uh, this, this, shows, uh, this shows what end uh, of the uh, economic spectrum I find myself on. But like, if you think of like a fancy restaurant, I can't think of the names of any fancy restaurants. You, know? you have a certain image in your mind. If you think of pizza rolls, you have a certain other image in your mind. right? So uh, th there's, a, there's a notion of branding, and that's important too. All right? There's a very famous quote, and I, I, I'm not sure who said it. The quote is famous. Let me go and 
hand. Find out who said it. Form follows function. The author, oh, okay. The, the authorship of the phrase is often, though wrongly, uh, ascribed to American sculptor Horatio Greenow. Oh, I'm glad I didn't say that then. Okay. I'll be darned. I, I, I guess it is less... Yeah, I guess it is less clear who said that than I thought it was. What does that mean, form follows function? That means that if it's sloppy, it's going to be hard to navigate through. That would definitely be under that umbrella. Uh, that that would be where um, that would be where maybe form didn't follow function. In other words, it wasn't wasn't designed in a very logical, straightforward way, and therefore the functionality of being able to navigate through the site is is bad. So yeah, I would say that would qualify. Anyone else? And keep in mind, this, this talks about a lot of things. This talks about not just building websites. You know, this is a quote from years ago before there were websites. Um, but, like, even think of, of, like, products, you know, or, or whatever. In essence, it means that you should decide what you want to use the particular object or thing or website for and design it in a way that supports that purpose. All right? You know, you, you probably have all seen things like, um, you know, like, like kitchen knives that have a certain grip, you know. If you think, what do you use a kitchen knife for? Well, really, you use, a kitchen, the, you use kitchen knives for a variety of reasons, right? Some you use to slice things. Some you, some you use to chop things. Well, the, the good knives, again, are designed to accommodate that. Their handles are do, done in a certain way so that you can design it. They're weighted a certain way. All those things... Are, are, are baked in to the product so that the way it looks and the way it's designed matches the use you're going to use it for. All right? And that almost sounds like that's too obvious to say, except for the fact that people mess it up often and people confuse attractiveness with usefulness. And people can uh, confuse simply looking good with being well designed. All right. There is such a thing as visual language. And funny thing about Google is because they know that I'm in the United States, it's not giving me things in other languages. I'm, I'm looking. I'm looking for a page in a. I'm actually looking for, ah, here we go, finally. How many of you here speak Icelandic? I intentionally picked a language that I was thinking, I was going to think with German, but I thought, you know, someone might have had German in high school or something, or at least know a little bit of it. So I picked a word. Uh, <laughs> See, I'm always thinking. I'm glad I thought ahead. No one speaks Icelandic, though, right? Good thing Bjork isn't in the class, all right, or would be in trouble. All right, let's look at this. I assume that none of us understand a word on this page, myself included. All right. What is the most important article on this page? Is it this one? Is it this one? Is it... This one? <laughs> no. What is the most important article on the page? This one. How do you know that that's the most important one on the page? Got the biggest picture? Biggest text? The, the position it is on the page is on the top left. Um, overall, it takes up the most space. So, in addition to all these other things, that physically is bigger than this 
and this. What article does this picture belong with? The one directly underneath that. How do you know that? Yeah, yeah because, because it would be kind of goofy if the picture here related to this article down there, right? And, and it's funny, it's, it's like all these things that you think about, it's like they're, they're obvious. They're obvious until someone doesn't do it right. Then it, then, it, then it isn't so obvious. These things are visual languages, all right? These things are expressions of visual language. In other words, what did we have? We had that, number one, bigger things are more important than smaller things, all right? It's funny because they say like in child development, like if you ask kids to draw something, um, you know, at, at a certain age, kids don't necessarily draw very realistically. You know, they just draw things. But they will draw things bigger that they think is more, are more important. You know, it's funny. I have a picture uh, that, that one of my daughters drew. And even though she's a younger daughter, she's like the biggest person in the picture. You know, which is like, well, that's good. She has a healthy self-esteem. Good for her. All right. Um, and again, that carries through in our visual language. The bigger things are seen to be more important. Things near the top, the position matters. All right? Now, it looks like someone got arrested for something. We could probably translate it, but that would be cheating. All right? Which are the ads on this page? That's an ad? And that's an ad. Is this an ad? No. Is this an ad? No. How do we know that? Well, we've, pardon me? A little bit of animation there to, to catch our attention. That implies that we wouldn't otherwise be interested in it, right? So they got to they gotta trick us into being interested in it, right? Um, this is more colorful. Again, sort of trying to draw us into it. There's really no text here, it's just a picture. All right. Among these things, which would you say is more important? Or let, let me rephrase it, is there a drastic difference in the importance of these things? These articles there? Probably not. Why? Well, they look the same, right? They all have the same size headline, they all have about the same size space on it. Maybe this one's slightly more important than that one because of the way they're stacked, but maybe not. All right. So the interesting thing is, is this what I mean by form follows function? The writers of this page, or the creators of this page, wanted it clear that this is the most important thing on the page. So what did they do? They designed it that way. They designed it to draw your eye to that by giving you the biggest picture, the biggest type, the biggest amount of total space. All right. This is visual language. This is the function of this page, you know, to communicate the most important news articles or to keep people informed and all that, is supported by the form of the page, how we've gone and how we've designed it. Uh, designed it. And th these are some common things, and my guess would be that we could pick any language in the world. And there might be a couple of differences, right? Other cultures, for example, Go in, go in the opposite direction, all right? So, so, yeah, there can be some slight cultural variances there, but still, I doubt if there's any culture in the world where a smaller headline means it's a more important news story, all right? Right, right, exactly. So it's still on the top, but, again, instead of left to right, it's right to left, so... Um, uh, that. And you know what? Even if we didn't know that, which I guess if you're reading a page in that language, you would probably know that, right? There would be other things like the size of, of the type and all that. Yes? No. Is there like a website you can go to that outline of, like, to help you out of where you put your most important topic? Or you just go to websites? I would, I would say it's pretty, it's, it's pretty. Um, how can I put this? That's a good question. Um, there probably are, you know, <laughs> you know, if you ask the question, is there a website that, the answer is yes, no matter what comes after the word that, right? 
Is there a website that will help you cross-country ski? Yes. Is there a website that will help you with your ping pong serve? Yes. You know, so is there a website that talks about how to lay things out in the most important way? Yes, I'm sure there is. But uh, a very famous web designer, uh, Jacob Nielsen, has something that he kind of jokingly calls Jake, uh, Nielsen's Law. And Nielsen's Law is this. He says that you spend more time, people are going to spend more time on other sites than on your site. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that it's important not to deviate too far from the conventions of what a website is. So, what are some of the conventions of websites? Again, most important stuff near the top and not near the bottom. Um, the top, very top of the page is typically a banner, right? Navigation will either be along the top or along the side. In some occasions, it could be along this side, all right? So you could probably find some guidelines, but it probably would just be as easy to observe. When I did journalism in high school, they, had, they said your eye kind of like went like this on the page. Now, I don't know if that's any different, you know, kind of like almost like a backwards nine. Your eye kind of st st starts here, scans across, and then kind of heads down. Yeah, yeah, well, that, you know, assuming that that hasn't changed, but yeah, I mean, that, that's like, again, sort of like a human nature thing, although there, again, there are cultural components too, but, you know. But, uh, again, um, some of these things are just, you know, baked into people's brains, you know, the, the, the size relating to importance. The other thing, and we talked about this, and I think I implied it, is similar things look sim should look similar. So, for example, let's say all of these look the same, but one of them had a different color headline and had a box around it. That's going to stand out. That's giving you a visual indication that that is different. All right? So, let's go back to the two questions that I asked, or the two, two things that, that we talked about. Is making a website attractive important? And we kind of said it might not be the most important thing, but it is an important thing, especially when you factor in uh, context, all right, and the fact that the standards for attractiveness, you know, are different depending on the context. You know, imagine if you are invited to a, you know, a dinner at the White House. What are you going to wear? Imagine if you are invited to a biker bar for someone's birthday party. What are you going to wear? In both cases, the appropriate clothing is likely to be very different. All right? So what constitutes attractive or appropriate clothing is going to be different in each of those two contexts. And it's sort of the same idea with that. Someone mentioned the obvious example, like a heavy metal band's website versus a professional site or a fashion site. So let's combine the two thoughts. Form follows functions and making it attractive is good. Well, what are some things that we can do to make a page more attractive? Color nice color scheme, a good color scheme. A color scheme that fits with the company's branding. All right. So what are we going to use those colors for? How can we use those? So we, so we said using nice colors is going to make it more attractive. What are we going to use those colors for? To, to, to show focus, to show importance. All right? In other words, yeah, I'm looking, uh, yeah, let me put that. In other words, well, here's a great example. As we click from page to page, notice that the page that we're on gets highlighted. The tab gets highlighted here. Ooh, I'm going to translate this one. So, what do they use color for? In this case, they use colors to highlight which of the links that you are on. 
Why is that an important piece of functionality? Well, it's important for people to know, as part of the navigation scheme, actually what page you're on. People are able to forget. In other words, you know, if all of these were the same, and I was on this page, I might click on that one again. Or I might not know that I visited, uh, 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 which page I'd visited. So identifying what page a person is on is actually an important piece of functionality. It helps them keep straight where they are on the site. So they're used, and, and they use color. It has the side effect of making it more attractive, but it also supports the function. Yes? That's a pretty big deal. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's, a, that's a pretty big deal. In fact, usually, for the most part, that's why most of the time, like if you're going to translate a page, um, you know, the Google Translate service does that for you. And even then, I have friends that speak other languages. They say that some of the translations that it comes up with is, you know, is, is not necessarily very good. You know, it might get the literal sense of the word right, but it sort of loses the... The, the spirit of what's being said. So yeah, that, that's, that's difficult. I mean, languages are complex. And then there are big corporations that do business all around the world that have their sites professionally translated. And exactly. And they know natively by the uh, IP addresses requesting that page what language to use. E exactly. That's a good point. You know. So in other words, if, if you were a, a, a multinational corporation and you know you did business with you know, people that spoke a variety of different languages. You wouldn't rely on software to do that. You would likely have a human translator to, to go and do that. And also to, to uh, be aware of uh, cultural differences. Again, um, you, know, di you, know, people, you know, people in the United States, there's colors that are associated with certain things, you know. Um, and in other cultures, it could be different. So. You have to be careful with that. Um, one, of the, one of the funny stories is, is um, and, and this is uh, slightly related to it, the, back uh, many years ago, um, the Chevy Nova, right? Anyone hear this story? Chevy no there was a car called the Chevy Nova, right? And apparently they, they started marketing it, marketing it in, in Spanish-speaking countries. And it didn't sell very well. All right, and why do you think it didn't sell very well? It means <laughs> Nova, which is just sort of I don't know. I, I guess that's like a you know that's a star thing here in English, but Nova is very similar to Nova, which means it doesn't go. So they're trying to sell a car that whose name means this car doesn't go. Right, so then they're wondering like why people don't buy it, you know, and there, there's a lot, there's other cases of that too, uh, and that's again that's just a small point. I guess the bigger answer to your question is is that is a real big question, and um, the suggestion would be instead of like relying on some kind of software to do it, um, you would you would professionally do it, and again what you would do is you would pick. Depending on your organization, you'd pick the languages that you thought you needed. And again, as, as was mentioned, you know, you can get redirected. That's why when I was Googling that before, I was getting frustrated. I was looking for other languages, and it kept sending me to the English version of these because it knows I'm in the United States, you know. So I finally found one uh, in another language, all right. Again, think of these things. The color makes this a little less boring. But it also serves a practical purpose in letting us know where we are in the navigation scheme of this page. All right. So when we talk about using these elements to make our page more attractive, colors, what's another element that we could use to make our page look better? Animations, Animations possibly. Images, certainly. We can use them, but we're going to use them in a way that supports the meaning of the page and supports the function of the page instead of just using them just for decoration. So we're going to try to make our pages look attractive, but purposefully attractive. 
and not just pretty or decorated, I guess would be a good way to say it. What's another thing we could do to make our page look more attractive? Pardon me? Yeah, logos. Um, that again is, a, is another example of an image that has an extra effect though of branding, of making sure we know exactly what page we're on. All right? People when they get to clicking, you know, they can end up all kinds of different places. Whereas a logo that clearly identifies what the organization is, you know, that's, that's something that, that is needed. And again, you, people can recognize logos even if they don't recognize the words, right? Um, again, it's sort of a visual language thing, the visual I, a language of icons and What are these two products? Pepsi and Coke. All right. Doesn't matter that you don't read that language. All right. You know that that is Pepsi and Coke, just at a glance. So, yeah, logos like that can do a lot to identify. You know, if you develop a great website and you develop great content, you want, you want to make sure people know it's yours. So that's where the branding comes in, making sure that people associate that. How many times do you hear, like, when the Super Bowl's around, I saw this great commercial. What was it for? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> but it was about this guy that did this. You know, it's like, hmm, I wonder how effective it was if you remember the, the details of the commercial, but you don't remember the product that it was for. So... Things like logos can go a long way. Again, that visual language. Another thing I would argue is, as far, is um, not cramming everything together. And, and they call it white space. Have space between stuff. All right? Space between the stuff. Along with color and all these other things, borders and all that, can do a couple things. First of all, it can make it easier to read. Right? If words are crammed together, it's very difficult to read. So you can have the best content in the world. If people can't read it, who cares? Second thing it, it does is it can make the page look more attractive. All right? In other words, a, a solid block of text is, is a little intimidating. It's, it doesn't look so good. But more than that, it can help the viewer, the reader, organize the page mentally by the spaces between stuff. So we know, for example, that this article isn't part of this article because there's a gap between it. Again, visual language. Doesn't matter if we can read the language or not, we know that those are two separate things because there's extra space between the stuff. And we can do that with color, we can do that with borders, we can do that any number of ways. So, we mentioned some things that make a page more attractive and you certainly want to use them to make your page more attractive, but you want to use them in a purposeful way. All right. You want to use color in a way that it'll make your page look good, but it sets some things apart. Maybe it organizes the page visually for the person so they can tell what part is the navigation and what part is the body of the page and so on. So use these things, but use them in a purposeful way, I guess I would say. All right. The other thing I would say is this is where overkill comes into play, right? Because if I'm using colors to emphasize things, if I'm using different colors to emphasize things, and every single article on the page is a different color, what gets emphasized then? Nothing does, right? It's, it's like the old joke, if every, or not old joke, but old complaint that people have about work. You know, my boss told me I have 10 number one priority items, right? Well, you got 10 number one priority items. Actually, you have zero number one priority items, right? You have 10 yeah, items, none of which stand out as more important than the other. 
So you don't really have any number one priority. So if you overuse these things, which are meant to make the page attractive, but are also meant to make the page more functional, you destroy the functionality. And you probably will destroy the attractiveness too, right? I mean, if you do an overkill of, uh, and again, I'm using colors because that's the, the most obvious visual one. But, uh, you know, you could say it for fonts, you could say it for images, and, and all that. At a certain point, more is not more. You know, there's another famous saying, and I, again, I think this is attributed to some of the uh, architects uh, of the 20th century, but less is more. Sometimes by putting in just a few things on a page, you make a bigger impact. All right, then by, by bombarding people with tons of stuff. Okay, so we've identified what makes for a good web page and a good website, and we've talked a bit about the appearance and whether the appearance is important or not, and we've talked about how we can use some of these elements to support the appearance, and we talked about visual language and all that. The question then becomes, what do we do if we're presented with a project to do? For example, your project, your semester project in here. How do you design? How do you get from the raw idea of I need to create a website for my organization to here's the finished product? All right, how do you do that? Well, there's a process that we're going to go through. The process is laid out in a book that used to be a textbook for this class, but it no longer is. Um, and, but you, you could probably find it in a library. And that book is called The Elements of User Experience by a guy named Jesse James Garrett. I don't know why you would use your middle name if your first name was Jesse and your middle name was James, but I, I don't know. Uh, at any rate. You said Jesse James Garrett? Jesse James Garrett, yeah. Well, that's right. Isn't, isn't Garrett the guy that shot Jesse yeah, James? Garrett, the guy that shot Jesse James. Wow, that is weird. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. I, I don't know what that says about his parents, if anything else. And it probably doesn't say anything about him. Yeah. <laughs> Could be. All right. So, what is the process that we're going to go through to get to this? Well, what should be clear from our discussion last time is the most important part of a website is getting in getting to the people that visit your website the information that they came looking for. All right. In a nutshell, a person should be able to use a website to do whatever it is they want to do. Well, how do we know what a person wants to do on a website? How, how, can, we, how can we guess that? You know? Someone visits Lorain County Community College's website. You know, let's say you visit it tonight and you're looking for something. How could the web designer possibly know what you are going to be looking for? Well, they might not know specifically for every individual, but can they make some assumptions? Okay. Okay. Right. So you can make some assumptions of who vi who's visiting your website and what their likely goals are going to be. All right. Now, is there only one kind of person that's going to be visiting Learning Com Community College's website? Pardon me? Is it only students? Okay. Students and faculty. So there's two kinds of people. Parents. There's three kinds of people. Okay, people that are not currently enrolled, but might be interested in enrolling. So that's four groups of people right off the top of our head in less than a minute we came up with. If we thought about it some more, we could probably think of some other things too. For example, just general people in the community that may not even be interested in, in taking classes, but are interested in the events that go on here. We have a film series at LC, we have you know, performances at Stocker, all those sorts of things. So it's true that, you know, no one can anticipate the needs of a group of thousands of individuals, 
But we can break down our audience into groups of the most likely kinds of users. And we can call those things personas. So, in the case of a school website, some of the personas might be current students. Prospective students. Faculty. Staff. Maybe these two go together. Parents. Community members. And we might be able to think about some more. And again, we're certainly not going to get into every individual, because every individual has some unique characteristics. I'm sure each one of you are coming from a different place when you first came to visit LC. You know, you're, you're, you're an individual. You have individual characteristics. But this is probably a decent summary of the kinds of people that are going to be visiting Lorain Community College's website. All right, People are thinking of going to school here. People are already going to school here. People that work here. Parents of people that are going or thinking of going to school here. And finally, just interested people in the community. So these are probably um, a decent mark. So we've simplified our problem quite a bit. We don't have to worry about the goals of how many people live in Lorain County? 300,000 people? All right. We don't have to worry about 300,000 people and their goals. We have to worry about five groups of people. All right. What about people that don't fit into any of these categories? Well, I hate to say it, but they might not necessarily be a priority. All right. Um, there, there could always be maybe some small need um, of people that, um, that, that doesn't fit into the, the, the standard mix of people that are visiting the site. So hopefully we do things on our site like having a search that works, all right, or our navigation is simple enough that we can accommodate those needs. What we don't want to do, though, is tip into the area of overkill where we try to solve every problem for every conceivable group of people. We want to we want to solve the most common, most important problems for our biggest categories of users. All right? We don't necessarily want to solve every problem that someone could dream up with. All right? I've seen a lot of websites go the wrong way because they try to be all things to all people. And you can't. You got to prioritize. If you try to, to, to handle everyone's problems, you'll end up handling no one's problems particularly well. So we want to focus. We want to focus on where we feel we can make the most impact. All right? Now, we talked about good design, and we talked about good design relates to people finding the stuff that they need and getting the information they want and getting out of the site what they are looking for. Another way to say it is that people, when they visit your site, have goals. All right? A goal of a prospective student visiting LC's site might be, well, is LC the right school for me? All right? What are some of the things, and again, that might be their broad goal. There could be some other sub-goals in there. What would help them determine that? Well. What kind of programs does LC offer? What's the uh, amount of tuition? Um, what classes are there available? Those kinds of things might help someone who is considering becoming a student figure out if LC is the right college for them. For faculty visiting it, um, faculty, may need, faculty and staff may need to find certain forms like I mentioned, like a vacation request form or, or whatever. 
Uh, faculty and staff may need to look up particular policies and procedures. Gee, I'm applying for promotion. When do I have to file the paperwork? And so on. Parents, of course, are only interested in what the amount of the tuition is. No, I'm just kidding about that part. <laughs> but they are going to be interested in that. You can, you can bet that. Community members might be interested in not necessarily degree programs, but maybe just what, like, uh, uh, personal fulfillment courses that they can take, maybe even non-credit courses. And they might be interested in cultural events. The idea is, is that each group of these people have goals. So our very first activity isn't going to be about what font we're going to put on the page, or what color we're going to make the text, or what images we're going to have. Our very first activity is going to be about defining goals. All right? Because again, if a well-designed website is one that helps people achieve their goals, well, you better have a pretty good idea of what those goals are. So our very first part of our design activity will be to look at the typical people that are going to be visiting our site and identifying what their goals are. All right. Next week, on Monday, we will continue to discuss this process of how do we take an idea for a website and turn it into an actual website. All right. We'll see you in lab.